Welcome to Westview, where life change happens. The Evening Women's Auxiliary are running a Toiletries for the Ladies in Need drive and would appreciate donations of the following toiletry items. Face cloths, body soap, toothbrushes, toothpaste, pocket tissue packs, small 100ml Vaseline, body cream and deodorants. You can drop the toiletries off on a donations table which you'll find in the sanctuary foyer. All donations should be made by the 11th of August. For more information, contact Liz. We appreciate your generosity and continued support. Westview August Preaching Series, Women as Agents. During Women's Month this year, we take time to consider the role of women as agents. We are taught, whether it is directly or indirectly, that women are the helpers, the auxiliary, the subcontractors, whether be it at home, workplace, church, or society in general. Bible phrases are used to convince us that women are forever the help, never the initiator, the tax leader, or the agent. However, this month, we meet some women who are agents in scripture. In chemistry, an agent is a substance that brings about a chemical or physical effect or causes a chemical reaction. In human experience, an agent can be understood to be a person who takes an active role or produces a specific effect. Women who change their world are women like any of us who understand that we are made and called to be God's agents in a world where healing and transformation are urgently needed. The Reverends Purity Malinga and Charmaine Morgan will be our guest preachers for this series. Please follow us on our Facebook, TikTok and Instagram pages or visit our website at www.westview.org.za. But don't keep us a secret, share our content with your friends and family. Greetings and welcome to this worship service. We continue with our series, which is titled Creed. In this series, we are using study material from Adam Hamilton. And so this week, we are reflecting on the statement of the Creed that says, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. As a way just to get us started, I would like to invite you where you are just to spend a moment in silence and to reflect for yourself briefly about why are you part of the church. Uh, you might be a member of the Westview congregation or any other congregation that you are a part of. Just spend a moment thinking about what is it about the church that draws you, that captivates you and that energizes you. Why are you part of the church? And then once you've thought about that question, when you are ready, you can join us as we worship God together in song. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians. We will. 
Please pray with me. Our God, the one who raises the sun each morning and lifts high the moon at night, the God who ushers us, the God who ushers us through cycles of rising, falling, and rising again. Though we stumble, you lift us. Though we doubt, you remain. And though we get weary, you revive. Holy One, your strange ways astound us. Among the mighty, your wisdom is called foolish. While others assert their power with force, yours unfolds like an invitation. You never resort to weapons. You turn from all parts of domination. Beauty and truth are your means of persuasion. Freedom is your promise. And you whisper things of vulnerability, of meals at table and sharing what we have of solidarity and new life. Make us faithful to the peculiar calling of Christ. Firmly plant your confidence in us. Come to us as we worship you this morning. Amen. Time has come now to be as generous to God and to the church as God is to us. Westview's banking details are on the screen. You can choose to make your offering now or you can wait until after the service. Hello Westview. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, our Saviour and Redeemer, we come to you with hearts filled with gratitude for the abundant blessings you give us each day. We acknowledge that cheerful giving is not an obligation, but a joyful act of worship. Help us understand that our giving is an expression of our deep love for you and our want to further your kingdom here on earth. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Hello, Westview. Our scripture readings today, we have three. The first from Matthew chapter 16, and then we read from 1 Peter chapter 2, and then from Ephesians chapter 4. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now we read from 1 Peter chapter 2. The living stone and a chosen people. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Our next scripture is from Ephesians chapter 4. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of fullness, of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And we thank the Lord for this word to us today. We ask him to bless it to our understanding. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the line of the creed that we are considering uh, today says, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. Now, the church, which is the community of believers, is also the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so it becomes important then for us to understand that to explore our belief in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints is also in a way to unpack and to clarify the work of the Holy Spirit within the life of the church. Now before even thinking about what we mean by the term church, let us explore what is meant when the creed says or when the creed affirms uh, that the church that you and I believe in is holy and catholic. The first thing to say is that when many people view the church, it looks neither holy nor Catholic. That when many people look at the church, it seems to be filled with hypocrites, with judgmental people. In fact, this is one of the many reasons why many people have turned away from organized religion and why so many young adults today say that they are spiritual, but they are not religious. Interestingly, the same young people have great admiration for Jesus, but far less admiration for his people and his church. They see neither holiness nor Catholicity when they look at the most vocal and the most popular churches around us today. And so it helps us to understand that when we say we believe in the Holy Catholic Church, we are not saying that the church is filled with righteous people who are almost perfect. The word holy in the biblical context simply means belonging to God or being sacred to God 
or being set aside for God. And so you have likely heard it said that the church is not a club of holy people or even of perfect people, but instead a church is like a hospital for broken people and sinful people who are being slowly made well by God. The church then is holy when those who are part of the church recognize that she belongs to God and that she does not belong to her members. And so the church is only holy when those who consider the church to be home do not ask the question, what do we want our church to do for us, but rather what does God want his church to do for him. But what about then the word Catholic? As used here, Catholic is actually an, ad an adjective. It does not refer to the Roman Catholic Church, at least not exclusively. And so Catholic comes from a compound Greek word that means in essence everywhere. Catholic means everywhere. The word came to be a reminder of the church's unity that in every community of believers across the Roman Empire and beyond those communities were bound together by the gospel, despite their differences in language or even ethnic makeup, these communities were part of one church, the church everywhere, the Catholic Church. With this basic understanding then of holy and Catholic, let's consider what Christians mean when they confess as a central part of their faith belief in the church. Let us begin by defining the term church. What does it mean? Uh, when we use the term church. Now, most of us already know that the church is not a building, though we refer to buildings as churches. These buildings are the physical spaces that churches inhabit and use for activities such as worship, fellowship, Christian discipleship, and mission. And so buildings are important tools, but the church is really the gathered people. The church is really a people. And so the Greek word for church that is used more often in the New Testament is ecclesia. Now, ecclesia is a word that literally means to be called out as in a gathering of people who are called together. This was not a religious term, but it was a secular term that often meant simply an assembly or gathering. It was used for synagogues, for synagogues, civic groups, and Christian gatherings. But church came to mean more than just an assembly or a gathering when it referred to Christians. The first time we see this word in the Gospels is when Jesus speaks to Peter and Jesus says to Peter, I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hate will not prevail against it. Here in Matthew 16 verse 18, Jesus speaks of my church, making it clear that the church is his ecclesia, it is his assembly, it is his gathering. The church is specifically a community or an assembly of people who belong to Jesus Christ. It is this relationship with Christ that distinguishes the church from a synagogue, from a civic uh, gathering, or even a social club. So in the New Testament then, the church is the gathering of people who are called out by Jesus, who belong to Jesus, and therefore who seek not only to experience fellowship with him, but also to do his will and his work in the world. That means that the driving mission of every local congregation and every local church is then to discern the will of Christ above all else and then go ahead and do it. The church then is made up of people whom the Lord claims as his own. Now listen to how Peter defines this in 1 Peter 2 verse 10. Once you were not a people, 
but now you are God's people. And so as human beings, we need community, we need belonging, we need others to encourage, challenge, care for us, and to be cared for by us. We are wired in this way. From a strictly secular perspective, we are healthier, we are happier, and live longer when we are in community with others. But from a spiritual point, we will never grow spiritually into the people that God wishes us to be without us being part of the church. Now, most people who leave the church drift away slowly. Those who leave the church drift away slowly. And I have watched this happen. So many of the essential things to the Christian spiritual life are lost when you don't have a community of others who are holding you accountable, helping you to grow, needing you to serve, but also challenging you to care for others, praying with you and for you and giving structure to your Christian life. The church then is meant to be a unique community, unlike other social clubs and organizations to which one might belong. Though the church does share some common characteristics with the best of these organizations. In Galatians 6 verse 10, Paul uses another metaphor for the church. He refers to the church as a family. Now, the idea of the church as a family comes with responsibilities. You see, families care for one another. Families work for the good of one another. Families support one another. And so the Greek New Testament word for this kind of caring for one another is koinonia, meaning communion or sharing. We usually translate this word as fellowship. It involves getting to know others, building relationships with them, and actively caring for and encouraging others. This was the purpose of the church, to foster, to build, and to serve as a community of people who are devoted to one another in brotherly and sisterly love, bound together by a common faith, working together to live out their faith in the world. And so we, are not, we, we not only are Christ's assembly, but we as the church are also his family. The church is also God's answer to our existential need for belonging, community, acceptance, support, and love. And so you don't ever have to be alone if you are a member of a church. You are to take this seriously. It is part of your responsibility in being the church. It means looking around to see who is alone, who may need a friend, who needs encouragement. It means inviting people to sit by you or even to ask if you can sit by them. Being church means checking on and caring for those who need someone. It means providing support and care for those who might be hurting around us. And so I would like to ask you the question, what are you doing to help Westview to become this kind of community? You see, caring communities are made up of people who go the extra mile, people who give up their time to serve others, people who go out of their way to bless others. It only takes a handful of people like that to inspire others to do the same. And so sometimes churches forget what it means to be the church. You see, the church was not a human invention. It was founded by God. The church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is a community that belongs to Jesus. The church then is meant to be a community of redemption and love, a place of acceptance and transformation, a place where we grow in our faith and find encouragement and support. This is what we mean by a koinonia or fellowship. But the church is not just about community. Now listen to the words of Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. 
you are the body of Christ and parts of each other. Now, this image of the church as the body of Christ is important. It means that the church incarnates Christ into the world today. And so we know from scripture that God became flesh through Jesus. This is what you also refer to as the incarnation. And so in the same way then, Jesus, after his ascension to heaven, becomes flesh through the church. And so we are meant to continue the ministry that Jesus began to represent Jesus to the world. And Jesus said it in this way, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then the Gospel of John chapter 20 tells us that immediately following this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Once more, we find that the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit are essential to the church in fulfilling Christ's mission in the world. The church also is the continuing presence of Christ in the world. And so Jesus came uh, about 2,000 years ago to show us the way, the truth, and the life, and to suffer, die, and then rise again to save us. But before his departure, Jesus gave his disciples the Holy Spirit and called on them to be his ongoing presence in the world and to continue his saving work of healing, teaching, proclaiming, and liberating people. All of this then means that when God sees pain and brokenness, when God sees injustice and need in the world, this God does not send angels to, trust, to address those things, but God sends the church. Now, here's how Peter describes the church in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. And so, how do we speak of the wonderful acts of God. I'm sure you would agree with me that we do it most profoundly by our actions, that it is by our love, compassion, kindness, and hunger for justice that we proclaim Jesus who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is what it means to be the body of Christ. And so if you are not regularly asking where does God need me and how can I love and serve others, then it is possible that you are not yet a Christian. This is not to say that you can ever be saved by your good works, but that God's grace which is freely given was meant to lead you and I into good works. And then the Apostles' Creed goes on to speak of the communion of saints. In the New Testament, this phrase of saints was Paul's preferred way of referring to all Christians. He addresses many of his letters either to the saints or to those who are called out to be saints. The call to be saints is then, uh, is at its core a call to the purpose which God created you and I. And so all Christians are called to belong wholly to Christ to become like him. It is the call to love God with all that is within us. It is the call to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. This is not something we can simply try harder to do, though we should desire it and pour ourselves into the task. But ultimately, the process of being transformed, of being sanctified, of being sanctified, is only possible by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so if we look at those we call saints throughout history or throughout the history of the church, most of those were ordinary people who just yielded their lives to God and through whom God worked in remarkable ways. 
These are people whose lives came to be defined by the way they loved. And so I know so many ordinary saints, people who daily seek to love their neighbors, who speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, people who show kindness and compassion for those who are hurting, people who sacrifice themselves for those, for others in ways that will never be publicly celebrated. And some of those people are listening to me right now. You see, ordinary saints take 30 minutes of work to go to donate blood and help to save a life. They turn off their lights when they leave a room in order to be good stewards of the earth's resources. These are people who visit prisoners at the local prison or show up on a Saturday morning to serve soup to homeless people. These are people who find ways to bless others without seeking recognition. They have a heart of compassion. These ordinary saints pay attention each day watching for moments when God needs them to reach out to someone who needs care. These are people who think less of themselves and more and more of others. These are people who seek to avoid doing evil. These are people who strive to do all the good that they can. These are people who practice the things that help them grow in love for God and others. There's one last thing to note about the phrase communion of saints. It is that it involves the word communion and is one of the most beautiful ideas in Christian theology. The idea is that those who are becoming saints here on earth, you and I, and those who have become entirely sanctified in heaven still commune together. And so then in conclusion, the church is holy because she belongs to God and is set apart for God's work. The church is Catholic because in God's eyes there is only one church, though it is made up of many tribes, nations, and denominations. God's church is a communion of saints below and saints above who are bound together as members of God's family. And so, yes, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. Amen. Just a few questions to ponder as we reflect on today's message. First question is, do, do you think it is possible to be a Christian but not to be part of the church? And why or why not? Secondly, how are you personally part of the body of Christ? In what ways do you represent Christ's continuing presence in the world? And then possibly one of the most important questions to ask ourselves is, does your church, or does Westview, find ways to challenge each member to grow, to serve, and then to honour each one's contributions? If so, how? Multiply your love through us To the lost and the least Let us be your healing hands Your instruments of peace May our single purpose be To imitate your life through our simple words and deeds, let love be multiplied. Multiply your love through me to someone in need. Help me, Lord, to freely give this great. 
grace that I've received. Let my single purpose be to imitate your And so, friends, let us bless one another as we say the words of benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>